So I started this conference by saying that this is a time of the year when Ashtangis get to experience what it's like to do Ashtanga in India, right? Because this time of the year, even for us in Southern California, it's humid. For, I mean, for us it's humid and the weather is a little bit hot for us. So after we've been probably doing our sun salutes and into it like the humidity is going to start to build in here, you're all going to start to sweat and if one of you had come in late or something, you'd walk through the door, you'd be like, <sighs> right? Which is what I get in the morning a lot of times when you go from the cool morning breeze and you walk into the humidity and 80 something degrees of the, the summer Ashtanga practice and it's, it's interesting because what I see is a lot of like drama. You know, people make all kinds of faces and they're like, oh my God, it's so hot in here. And you know, I get all this, you know, stuff. And, and I was thinking about, um, actually for the Ashtangi, this is what we want. We really want, without using the heater, to have a humid room and we, we want that natural heat because it's good for our joints and it helps us sweat and purify and, and all the things that we look for in our practice. And yet, um, kind of going back to our teachings, what we've been you know, talking about is how we've evolved into a place where um, the things that we've created to make us more comfortable are actually the same things that are making us weak and making us sick. And one of them is we go from one climate controlled box to the other. You know, we'll be in this climate controlled box and then we'll go to uh, our, our little box with four wheels, to our box at home, and we control the climate so we're always comfortable. But really this is, we, what we've realized is this is not good for us. And, that, and my point is, and I want to say this again this week, is we are not designed for that. Uh, when, when we were designed as human beings on planet Earth, we were designed for being challenged for the seasons, to be chased by tigers, and now we're saying to fall in love and have our hearts broken, right? And when you're really living that way, when you're really living to be challenged and you're really living um, in the seasons of life and you're really living with your heart wide open, um, you realize you're happier, you're stronger, and you're healthier in what we use for yoga, physiologically, energetically, and emotionally or spiritually, right? And so for me, this time of year is beautiful because this gets to be a metaphor for uh, what we're doing here in our yoga mat, which is our training ground, which is to say, I want you guys to come in here and sometimes be uncomfortable. I want you to practice being uncomfortable. And I want you to know that when you are uncomfortable, because we're going to sweat a lot today and it's going to get humid, that you will acclimate and you will adapt to that. And hopefully, I'm kind of hypnotizing you right now, you will, you will love it. <laughs> right? That's the ending part of this. But the truth of it is, uh, we do acclimate. And the body does adjust. But there's that initial like hit where we're not comfortable and you know we don't like not being comfortable and you know what I don't have to not be comfortable right so this is a great training ground for us in life as well as to be like I'm going to come into a situation and rather than getting all dramatic about it is to actually see if I can drop into it and be with it so and this is and this is really training for life you know, um, I was saying to some of my students that have teenagers, it's like as human beings as well, like we do that whole empty and full thing like where we want to always be the empty vessel so we always want to learn and we always want to grow and we always want to expand. But we know that when we get to the age of being a teenager, we're like, the vessel's full and we're like, I know it all, I don't want to hear it and I've got it all figured out, right? And a lot of times with teenagers too, you might get a lot of, not you of course, but you might get a lot of like sassy pants or like, you know, like drama, like, oh gosh, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you're doing that. Which is kind of like my example with the humidity as well. Like where we see that and you're like, oh my gosh, you're being so dramatic about this, right? But the truth of it is, it is on all of our paths as human beings to be challenged where we're not in our comfort zone. It's something where we don't have to deal with this. Um, but there's that opportunity for us to drop into it. That opportunity for us to actually deal with something without a lot of stress and without a lot of drama and to, as much as you can, be present with whatever the challenge is that's presenting you.
So the topic for this week's conference is, and Adriana, on this note, will you shut this door for me as well? Yes. The topic is meditation. And I love this topic because I teach yoga for a living, right? But I really love this topic because I'm an Ashtanga teacher. And if we review what Ashtanga is, Ashta means eight. What's Anga? Limbs. So this is an eight limb tr practice. The first four limbs, so I don't have a lot of time, I'll go through really quick. Yamas, Niyamas, Asana, Pranayama is how you are, how you show up in the world, how you treat yourself, your breath practice, and your physical asana, your form practice. What are the other four? We say those are the external limbs of your tree. What are the, what are the other four? Yeah, the internal limbs of your tree. So pratyahara means that you're going to withdraw from your senses. Dharana means you're going to hold something. What are you going to hold? Your mind. You're going to hold your mind in one place. You're going to focus. Dhyana, meditation. So we're moving in. We're moving towards being in a state of meditation. And then samadhi, which is kind of the good stuff you get after that, right? So this means that 50% of what you guys are doing on your training mats here, your yoga mats, is meditating. Because you're trying to focus your mind in one place. And there's a lot to be said right now. As meditation has become more popular in our culture. It used to be one of those things where you hear about meditation, you think it's very spiritual or kind of weird people do meditations. And now it's become not only normal, but there's so many statistics and research on, on meditation right now that everyone knows that yoga is yoga, but everyone knows that meditation is good for you, right? It's almost now like saying, eat your vegetables, because vegetables are good for you. It's almost household now to say, do your meditation, because everyone knows meditation is good for you. As a yoga teacher, what I see a lot over the years is this what's come into the play with when you hear the word meditation is the word guilt or should. I should meditate, right? I should, I'm, I'm gonna start next month. Or I hear a lot of people say, I don't know how to meditate, you know, or it's something that in one way I would say to you is very simple, but we make it very complicated, you know, in that sense. So um, I wanna say to you guys, if someone says to any of you in this room, do you meditate? Yeah, every time you come to your yoga mat, this is, at least 50%, if not more, meant to be a moving meditation where the methodology of Ashtanga is really set up so that you can come here and try to hold your mind and focus your mind on one place. And the benefit of that is that for that one hour, you feel pretty good, right? Whatever stressors you have in your life, whatever is waiting, lurking outside the door, does not belong on your yoga mat, right? So you feel good for that hour, but what about after? Then you go back to feeling stressed and Nutty Burger and driving really fast and on the phone all the time and just like life is out of hand. I hope not. <laughs> but the idea is training. If you do enough chaturangas, you will train your arms to be stronger, your back to be stronger. If you do enough focusing for one hour on your yoga mat, the idea is that we the neuroplasticity, as we understand it, is we're actually creating neural pathways and that we're also training the brain the, um, the gray matter of the brain, the hippocampus, the uh, amygdala, there's all this research to show that for doing yoga for one hour and meditating one hour, you can physiologically change your brain. It has been proven. So your one hour here, not only is you feel pretty good for the hour, but you leave here having done something that I always say it's kind of like the charge effect. The way you um, get energy through your body and you have more energy when you leave here, like the windmills are charging your phone, it has the same effect on the brain where we leave here feeling better and whatever problems are going to come at you today, hopefully you'll be able to like be able to handle them in a way that feels sort of like you've trained your mind. So rather than being a victim to whatever's happening in your life, you are in control of how you deal with that. I had something happen yesterday. I got a phone call yesterday. Not a good phone call. You know, and I immediately like saw myself, I was just like, all right, Di, how are you gonna show up for this? You know, and I could like at every reason, it was a fact to be stressed, to be worried, to be all those things. I made a conscious decision. And it was great because the more you meditate, the more it becomes a choice to be like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm not gonna get stressed about this. I'm gonna do A, B, and C. Hopefully those will work. 
you know, right? But it was a very, but that is, that is what I want to say to you. Like, why do yoga? Why meditate? Why do all these things? Get rid of all the shoulds. Is that it's something that actually helps us do every part of life a little bit better. So uh, what, the, one of the things I want to say to you guys, I want to give you a challenge um, without any shoulds, but if that has been in your mind, like I love meditating on my mat, but I would like to have a meditation practice off of my fat mat. I'm going to give you guys a 30-day um, invitation to do a meditation practice and give you some ideas after class on how you can go about that. On our homepage, we have um, John Capet Zen's. We have the gratitude practice. T and I taped for 30 days. Um, the meta practice, which is a love and kindness practice, which is very simple that people have been doing for thousands of years. All of those as opportunities um, for you guys to practice. But the one thing I want to say, because I'm running out of time here to say everything I want to say, is um, there's one reason why all of you continue to come back to this yoga practice, because you all have very different lives. But there's one reason why you all keep coming back day after day, week after week, year after year, knees hurt, uh, backs hurt, all different things going on in your life. So why do you keep coming back to your yoga mat? Why do you keep coming back to yoga? Why? Yeah, because it, yeah, because it makes you feel good and it works for you. So what I want to say to you is this about meditation. Don't do meditation for any other reason other than that. Make it your own, make it very personal, make it fit your life, make it fit what makes you happy. And if you finish doing your meditation and it feels good, do it again tomorrow, if it feels good, do it again. Experiments, vadyaya, self-study. Try it for 30 days and say, you know what, I don't know if this is gonna work for me. This could be crap, it could just not be my thing. Try it for 30 days and see if like your yoga practice, at the end of it you feel like, you know what, this is worth doing, I love this. So I am going to give you some ideas at the end of your practice for different ways that you can all sort of individualize and make this your own.